Do I call you Jim, Sony? What do you like to be called these days? I don't care, but you can never change or go back and switch it later. So you have to commit for a lifetime going forward of either Jim or Sony. How about JS? We'll start a new one. Ooh, that's going old school. That's going like back to Catholic school or something. Somebody used to call me JS. Hey, JS. <laughs> well, whatever it is, thank you for taking the time. Obviously, one of those longtime fans over here. I was watching the night you were on Letterman. So that makes it what, 25 years of fandom, 30 years of fandom, somewhere around there? 30. Oh, Letterman. Yeah, 94. Yeah. Well, my math was off right there, but you have been prolific in the last 10 years. And I say that because, sure, the EPs and solo efforts and all that, but writing a book while doing all of that, that's, that's, writing a book is like four albums, right? <laughs> uh, I don't even have a comparative model for writing a book because it is just a commitment to doing it, trying to do it every day, uh, knowing that I had never done one before it wasn't very reassuring. So, uh, but I was, I guess, wise enough to overshoot. Someone had suggested write a certain amount of like words, you know, uh, you know, 60,000, 80, 100, 100, and whatever. And I ended up writing, I think, 120,000 words for what would become an 80,000 word book. So, <laughs> I'm dealing with that same thing with a book that I've written where I turned in 93,000 and they went, well, we, we wanted 70,000. So in your case, did you worry about what they cut out? Well, we cut it out together. It was a willing uh, and, and, and situation. Uh, so I got to work with a uh, editor an editor called uh, Luke Dempsey. And this was before I had a publisher or anything. I just wanted to make my manuscript better. And I had some good advice that someone said, I know you've written 120,000 words yourself, but it likely needs help. So I worked with an editor and, and we cut out a lot of things, you know, willingly is for me, it was a lot of uh, more childhood stuff, uh, right. a lot of soccer and sports stuff that were important right. to me, but not important in such great detail. People didn't need to know that I scored, you know, 12 goals my sophomore year of high school soccer and all that. That it's proved to be unimportant. And uh, and some of the even uh, for me, since it's a book about recovering from addiction, right. a lot of the stories, there were way too many available. And I had written a lot of them and they're like, yeah, you got the point across in those other 10 stories you told about your, you know, debauchery. So let's cut out the other 16 you, you put in there. Right. Uh, but as I mentioned, new EP this year that you were able to get out within months of the book coming out. When did you actually finish the EP? We started working at it uh, in really in 2021. I had been writing songs and gathering material and the idea. And then I think around either the end of 21 or the beginning of 22, we got in a studio in Nashville and uh, got some basic tracks. And as it turns out, without either of them being planned this way, the book release and the EP sort of correlate within a month of one another, which is... Yeah. Uh, helpful to me in a promotional sense because I get to go out and promote two creative projects that live in a similar space in terms of uh, the messaging. It's about uh, my music is about uh, overcoming and about uh, you know a higher power that can uh, help you through some things and and so is the book. So we we end up uh, promoting two things, one on paper and one on well the the digital ether wherever music lives these days. Did you have any idea when you were working on the book that Tim Summer also had a book in the works? I did. In fact, I'd started writing mine several years before Tim came to the band to sort of ask for, I guess, blessings to say, hey, I'd like to write this book. Uh, here's what I'd like to shape it like. I need your help because uh, I need your words and your memories. And I said, uh, yeah, that sounds like a great book. I trust Tim as a songwriter, uh, sorry, as a book to uh, a writer. Uh, Tim is great. I knew, I knew that that was going to be fabulous. And so he um, ended up uh, writing a great book, but I told him I'm already two years into mine. So, you know, 
it's not like they are in conf conflicting uh, ways at all. They're just two books that are about a similar time period. Uh, mine, my personal book starts a lot earlier and right. um, in my life, but uh, yeah, it's all uh, all good with uh, Tim's book. I love it. I was happy. I knew I would enjoy reading it, and the way he thinks and tells stories is is one of a kind. When we dig into Tim, we just hear more and more like, oh, I was a punk rock guy, NYU, underground. And the more we dig into you and Hootie, you've always been the sports band. I, re I remember the Fairway to Heaven VH1 stuff and the only one to be with you video. It was always about sports with Hootie and the Blowfish. What was your common ground with Tim? Was it a particular band or, hey, we need a record deal. You were the guy. Well, I mean, I don't know what true common ground there was in, in terms of the record business. Tim was coming from a different place. He's in the business world of making records and putting them out. And he comes from a more alternative musical background. Right. And, you know, we are uh, writing more along the pop and rock lines. So I don't think we necessarily fit his taste of music. But the middle ground is that Tim would have liked to have been successful in signing a band that could sell some records. And we had a pretty successful model already built. We had, we were managed. We had owned our own merchandise. We owned a van. We toured. We had a fan base that was strong on the East coast. Uh, we sold our own music and owned it. And so it, the middle ground was that it looked like something it could have that would work, you know, if, and, and the promise that Tim made us, is the middle ground. Tim said, I don't want to change what you're doing. I don't want to change your music or this non-image you have. I just want to get it to a bigger group of people. <laughs> right. Non-image. I, I don't say that Hootie was one of the non-image bands of the 90s or today, because there's so many bands that were totally faceless, like without naming names. Okay, actually, let me name a name here. And this is not a 90s, 2000s, or today's band. Steve Miller. Does anyone know what Steve Miller looks like? Only I do. Well, not only I do. I do because it was one of the first albums I ever bought. So back in the 70s, you just could stare at whatever artwork was available. And right. that's something you knew. So, uh, yeah, Steve Miller, not one of your faces of rock and roll. <laughs> no. Well, another creditor, another thing that I dug about Hootie, I interned for Atlantic Records in like 2000, 2001. And I remember Hootie had the label Breaking Records, where you put Jump Little Children onto the map. Virgin Wool was another great band. So you guys were friends with a lot of bands and pushed a cool music scene of like-minded individuals back then. Yeah, we were interested in the spirit of sort of brotherhood. And, uh, you know, we had been granted some success and had a little luck and hard work both that caused it. But we felt like, God, what's the best thing to do is to see your peers uh, be able to follow a similar path and uh, get on the radio, make a quality record. That's that's all we had intended, I think, with starting breaking records. And uh, so we, yeah, we had a lot of these people that we had met along the way. Some were, were people we idolized, and then we became peers. And then in sales, at least, we surpassed them. But we just wanted to help out some other bands that we thought were great and that we knew personally. And I guess. In hindsight, for me personally, I learned that after a bunch of years of breaking records and some frustration, I realized that, wow, we we actually are the label. And artists typically look at the labels. The man. The man. <laughs> Partners, maybe. Uh, the authority, uh, the ones who control your destiny, more likely. And so I realized, God, this is so hard. I'm learning so much, but it's frustrating. And the bands aren't breaking that we that we're hoping to break. I'm like, yeah. oh, that's because we became, we we signed up to be the man when we started breaking records unknowingly. We just wanted to help our friends and really in a business sense, we were signing up to be the suits. <laughs> no good deed goes unpunished. And before I ask you a little more about your EP, I just said the man, you said the man. Darius is synonymous with being friends with Ric Flair. Do you have Ric Flair interactions from over the years? Sure, because of Darius's uh, uh, relationship with him. Uh, he come, had been coming down to our uh, charity celebrity pro-am golf event for many years. Oh. So in the hanging out and the 
you know, uh, those events. Yeah. I saw Rick all the time through a bunch of years and, um, I was never a wrestling necessarily fan, but he's an iconic personality. Uh, so it was always fun to, to interact and our kids were always, uh, majorly impressed as well. You got the soccer gear on now. We know you're a Liverpool guy. Hey, sports guy, not sports entertainment. Well, it's, it's funny. Right. Yeah. There's sports. We have to be careful how we define that word. I, I, yes. I like sports that appear more real. Let's just say that. And yeah. so, yeah. And we were, you know, the sports thing with Udi was funny because we, uh, we were sports guys, you know, we played sports and we like enjoyed them and then we watched them and we had idols and, uh, but we never thought that would necessarily interface with our band journey yeah. or our, like you said, our image to think. And, and eventually I'm not sure if it served us well altogether, the whole golf marriage. Uh, I don't know. Golf to me seems, it seemed like an uncool old stodgy wealthy white guy sport and i thought until you and alice cooper changed that yeah well and tiger woods frankly you know uh changed it too uh, probably him before us and um so i don't know it can work to an extent and especially like in our career which eventually uh came downward and sales uh started getting smaller the sports entertainment uh angle was still there for us when there wasn't a new single being played on the radio when Atlantic records maybe weren't uh, as interested in, in, in pushing hard to get our newer singles yeah. on the air, at least sports entertainment was always like, yeah, hoodie, the sports guys, let's get them on here. That's actually a fantastic thing. That's been in the, my, the back of my mind for a long time. When Fairweather Johnson came out and they're like, Oh, what a failure. It only sold 6 million copies. And you're like, any band would kill to sell 6 million copies of an album. It was ridiculous the the expectations that were on you guys but it's amazing to see the third act and the fourth act the movie ted that that that's probably the fifth act at this point in time because that definitely brought a new generation of fans they went oh yeah i used to like those guys and now they go no i still love those guys hence why every tour you do seems to be bigger than the last one well there's an odd shape to our success <laughs> uh, if you will you know certainly five years of writing songs and playing clubs and paying our dues yeah. to hone the craft uh, is enough for, for somebody to, to enough of a due to pay. And yeah. then we get signed and things go insane. Like you couldn't imagine, obviously with so much uh, attention and sales compacted into a small period. And, um, you know, weirdly we benefited in the way that some of the classic rock bands can say they benefited we had enough of an impact at a certain time on a certain format, which was called the CD, yeah. uh, that when that format changed, because yeah. we had a big enough imprint on the CD, people needed to find the new way. So we succeed, succeeded in going from the compact disc over to downloading, just like the Eagles and all the classic rock bands, if they were at the top, went from cassette LP into CD. You yeah. had to buy the new version. So we we got lucky that we were so high up on the sort of sales uh, list or, or amount of fans we had that those fans wanted to download us. And then again, go into streaming, they wanted to stream us. So we have somehow successfully gone through three formats here and uh, it shows. I mean, I look at our Spotify numbers from last year, you know, there's sort of, I just happened to look at it yesterday. I, uh, this is why I know it off the top of my head, 11 million followers. 86 million streams. So that's because of Spotify. You know, that's... Yeah, that's just the last five to 10 years. You know, not bad for a bunch of has-beens or a, a 90s band concerned that's all the last five to 10 years. Yeah, and, and you know, <laughs> we were... The CD band somehow made it into yes. a streaming band. And Amazing. if you don't, if you don't, then your the royalty checks get smaller and the fan base shrinks off and dies away but we seem to have sustained. And yeah, the movies, like you mentioned, uh, appearances from here and there, of course, it would be, uh, you know, obvious to mention that Darius's solo career yeah. left us above water, honestly, like him becoming uh, a notable uh, 
number one singles, number one albums, Grammy awards, that keeps hooting the blowfish above the waterline where we might have sunk a little bit and, and uh, gone to the bottom of the ocean. Uh, and so he helps keep it up there. And uh, so I love that. I mean, that, that's really one of the main main ways that you can stay afloat is have your singer uh, not only become a star in a, another genre, but uh, also acknowledge, hey, I'm not just Darius the Country Guy. I, I came from a place called Hooting the Blowfish, uh, for those of you that care, and uh, we're still a band. So uh, kudos to him for always acknowledging that, and he didn't have to. Well, down to the last two questions here before I let you go. And the first one is such a prolific 2022 between the book and the EP. After a series of EPs, you've never stopped. Do you know what 2023 looks like for you professionally, or is it time to take a little time off? Well, I've learned something from putting out music for about a decade on my own. And uh, I've, I've been out speaking. I speak to recovery groups as a result of my recovery. I've been doing that for quite a long time. And the more uh, spiritual music ends up being music, I can perform to those a lot of those groups too. And I've enjoyed right. that sort of speaking and singing. And now I put out a book and it gives me another platform uh, and a bigger story to tell that's not just recovery. It's about the, the hootie journey. It's about uh, you know, reinventing yourself, our funny family twist that we have in Hooting the Blowfish. Yes. There's a lot in there that I realized when I put the book out and started doing book events and some other speaking engagements, I'm like, wait, I could I just come out and sing and, and speak about this, the whole journey, a little recovery, a, a little hootie. I'm, you know, I'm a songwriter for the band and I'm a solo artist. Can right. I sing a few of my songs and a few hootie songs that I was writing uh, one of the important writers on? Can I do that? And the last four months have been uh, an overwhelming yes. And so I think next year, 2023 is going to see me out doing more engagements uh, to hopefully bigger audiences that include uh singing speaking laughing uh some interaction and q a there's a model there where i can i can go have a really fun time and i think there's a lot of enthused audience members that are seeing wow this is kind of a cool and unique story to bring along as a solo artist me my acoustic guitar and a microphone and we get to do all those things we laugh we get a little serious we talk about the things behind the curtain that the fans didn't see and that's, that's, I think, what I want for 2023 is getting out there as a speaker. Looking forward to something like that coming to New York, of course. And the last thing I got for you, random question here. When I was interviewing Tim Summer for my book, which I'm still waiting on the Q&A back, I'm writing a, a book about David Lee Roth uh, and how awesome he was slash is. Hootie's influences, we always heard about Tom Waits and R.E.M. and the college rock. But was there a lot of Van Halen influence on Hootie? Oh my gosh, the, the, the influences that we are known for are few, but you, you can't uh, deny that we were lit hard rock, uh, either metal or hard rock from, I mean, Iron Maiden to oh. uh, Ozzy to uh, Van Halen. There was tons of rock in there. I mean, I had those first four Van Halen albums on LP and were listed at home. The first one put out in the 70s. Can you believe that? Yeah, 78. So it's, uh, it's, it's one that's not talked about as much as is the Southern rock uh, influence on our band. That's a, that's a huge genre of music that was sort of more short lived seventies uh, and early eighties, but major influence on the band. So Van Halen. Yeah. We, we loved Van Halen and you know, we, it's one of the few bands we never attempted to cover. Um, it was a little out of uh, Darius's range uh, stylistically more than anything. We ran into David Lee Roth recording our third record. We were out in a studio in uh, the San Fernando Valley doing musical chairs, uh, our third record. And he was in a studio in the other room and we're like, what? David Lee Roth? I mean, we're not, we can't not go barge in and act like we are our best friends. And we did. We also saw the Van Halen guys in Europe in the, in 96, which is in the book. We shared a, on a festival and have a really nice interaction that I remember from there. I mean, what an iconic, iconic band. I, it's hard to call them influential because our music doesn't sound anything like them, but they absolutely were uh, huge for, for most of the Hootie and the Blowfish members. I can imagine, but thank you you, JS, for the many years of great music.
and looking forward to what's to come in 2023 and beyond. Thank you for being you and presenting such a unique journey as a person and putting it on paper beyond the music. Well, we are going to keep uh, trudging on. We're young because of the Rolling Stones. They make everybody look young. The Beach Boys and the Stones <laughs> make everyone look young. So As long as they get on a stage, we are young. <laughs> Thanks, and have a wonderful rest of the day. Thank you. Outro.